please join me in welcoming Jevin West. Perfect. All right, well, thanks, Liz, and thanks, Holly and Dietram and the committee that organized. What, a, what an honor, and thanks for coming after dinner. I know you could have all left on the bus and gone back to the hotel, or for those that are local, you didn't have to come. So thanks a lot. It, it really is an honor. You, many of you have been looking at this probably either out in the foyer or here. Just, just, I'll just quickly say what it is, because Holly's like, you've got to explain what this is. Uh, there, this started with a conversation with Holly and others at the National Academy saying, we want to put some seminars together around the field of misinformation. And as you would expect, it's spanning lots and lots of fields. And so we have lots of different methods we experiment with um, in trying to look at data beyond just you know, examining thousands and hundreds of, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of rows in a database. And so she asked if we would put together a few visualizations with this emerging um, field. And by the way, this is just work in progress. But what you're looking at, the core area is a set of papers that are published, um, that are identified from the National Academy and some some efforts in building uh, writing reviews. So there was a, a, a review that was put out by the National Academy of reference and, and references in that review on science communication and uh, uh, basically a bibliography. And from there, we start crawling the literature forward and backward, looking for all the papers that cite those papers. So the middle node represents all the papers around the kinds of things we've been talking about actually all day and probably tomorrow. Many of you are in that set. And the, and the nodes on the outside represent the most influential papers citing that core set of papers around science communication and misinformation. And then the links are, are links between them. And so what it does is we're trying to compact this complexity uh, with this Nautilus. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But you can go and play with it afterwards. We have other kinds of visualizations using the same data. But your homework is to figure out what happened here. Anyone have an idea what happened here? This is uh, influence of papers in this corpus. Anyone want to take a guess? Dietram found what that paper was because he scrolled over it. You can actually scroll over it. So anyone have an idea what happened in that year? This was the year 2005. Uh, actually, I'll just leave his homework. I'm not going to tell you. You guys have to go check it out. Um, but, but the one thing I will note, I will well note before I get started on my actual talk, this wasn't my actual talk, is that look at all the different fields that are in, being influenced by the work in this area and in this field. And like I said, many of you in this room are in this corpus. You have people, the, the blue represents computer science. You have sociology, medicine, economics, psychology, political science, biology, and life sciences, ecology, climate change research, that citing work. And the size of the node represents important papers. And you're going to see it just turns one more time. There was a really important paper in 2012, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about it, but maybe those in here can look at it. So anyway, that's the homework for you to do. You can go look at some of the co-authorship graphs. This is work in progress, and we're going to keep adding data as we scrape the literature. All right, let's get to the regular talk, though, about uh, a little bit of uh, BS, maybe, um, in science. And this is going to be a public talk, and I talked to uh, one of the, the patrons here, supporters, and said, just go have fun. So let's have fun. This is a public talk. Um, hopefully, you won't be offended by a few things that I joke about. And if you do, then come talk to me afterwards, and I'll, I'll try not to put it in another um, talk. But I thought, let's, ha let's have a little bit of fun. So we'll start off with something we all know. We are inundated with information, and so much of it is BS. We know that politicians are unconstrained by facts. <laughs> Hyperpartisan media pander to our political predilections. Information, informative headlines have been replaced by clickbait. We've known this for a long time. Advertisers, they feed us with a steady dose of hyperbole. Administrative, this is what I'm realizing now uh, that I'm on a campus more often. Administrative activity often amounts to a sophisticated exercise in the combinatorial reassembly of weasel words. <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting used to this more, and I'm one of those weasels too, I think. I, I think. Um, and then the average American really spends more than Two hours a day on social media doing what? Mostly spreading BS. We know that our information environments are torrential. They're addictive. They're unreliable. They're insincere. Everyone knows that, whether I'm talking to young kids in high schools or I'm talking to people at a city hall. We know that's the case. We know that most people just don't read the headlines, don't have time for the headlines. Maybe you, some of you saw this, that 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. But some of you may know what's underneath. If you actually click on the article, if you actually click on the article, 
It's random text. <laughs> and if you, if you look at the most current, actually, when I, took this, when I took this screen capture, this was so long ago when it first came out, it was like 53,000. You should see, it's very depressing how many people only read the headline. But I, we all do it. So the question is, is science any different? We would only expect, of course, to um, not, well, we would never be influenced by anything but the facts. We, we read the full papers, don't we, of course? Um, we live, like when I was a kid, I have this, I've always had this love affair for science. I figured science sort of happened in these studies. It was sort of driven by imagination. It was truly epistemically pure. But we know that's not the case. We know that science is, is, is being driven by humans and humans respond to incentives. And by the way, this is a colleague of mine, so we can make fun of Andrew Reid. And, 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 and I guess I have to be completely honest with this. I was putting this slide, I put this slide together today because I was kind of embarrassed making fun of Andrew, when in fact, I'm also just as sullied as Andrew, and I also realize I'm wearing the same shirt. So <laughs> Mike, Mike was worried this morning that he was wearing, he was worried he was wearing, I actually am wearing the same stupid shirt. I have more than one shirt, but not many more than one. Um, and I've been talking, I've had the opportunity, at least in the Northwest, to reach out to other groups. I actually went to a, a dental conference and I, I gave some talks uh, about sort of statistics and sort of being um, hoodwinked with data. And they have many concerns. Many of you already know, we've referenced the fluoride thing. So in addition to the fact that science is being run uh, by humans and there are, that sort of leads to things like publication bias, you have you know, conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones and Infowars pushing this. Um, and actually, at this conference, this dental conference, one thing I really learned from them is that they're having a lot of truth decay um, in, in the dental school, for sure. So um, that was my, my favorite line. I wanted to make sure I got that one in by the end of the day. But also, um, you guys are so kind. I thought it could go dead on that particular <laughs> laugh. But, um, but we also have, this is just current, just a, actually a couple days ago. Some of you I know that I follow on Twitter sort of saw this as well. Um, this was a story in The Guardian. By the way, Guardian is a great uh, journalistic uh, venue, but they were writing about why smart people are more likely to believe fake news, and they were citing one of, a my, one of my colleagues, David Rand's paper and, and Gordon Pennycook, um, and what happened was they had totally got the reference wrong, and so as some have said on Twitter, all, now we're already talking about, there's already fake news about fake news. And so we're sort of contending with the Alex Jones, that we're contending with these humans that are, that are, that are sullied, and we're, and we're also contending with technology. Um, this is one of my favorite channels I go to, I still go to, my, my seven-year-old's really into the, this live video feed of the International Space Station, but if you go there, even after these fixes that YouTube has claimed to have made changes to, I still get recommendations for the Earth being, or sort of being, uh, I'm being tempted to co- Look at uh, videos asking if the Earth is actually flat, when in fact I'm watching in real time, you know, a spherical object and, you know, <laughs> these kind of things. Um, but just what just that came out yesterday was a, an article in Bloomberg um, that revealed after this claim by YouTube that they're making changes, which is good. I, 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 I commend them for making these changes. But now employees are coming out and saying that they've known all along that these, these issues were there. It wasn't just algorithm running out of control. Leadership knew that they were pushing out more and more of these conspiracy-laden videos, but it was all about engagement. That was the only thing they cared about. And so this is where society needs to engage, and science in particular needs to engage. But one question that's sort of been ringing in my head, and I think others, I've had conversations even in this meeting about this, you know, is you know, technology a cause of a lot of the problems that we're seeing in science or society in general, or is it possibly also a symptom? One of my postdocs just recently in our lab, he went to, um, he went to uh, the actual Flat Earth Conference in Denver this year to try to understand what, what is driving or what, what are they thinking. So interacting, not just in online spaces, but Pete Kraft, is, he's doing a lot of good work sort of interacting with these different groups. I think that's important for us to, to try to understand. And, um, and one of the things, my, my colleague, Carl Bergstrom, who I've been doing a lot of this work with in engaging in the public in this kind of content, we kind of have contests every once in a while. And one of the contests, um, well, we've had like, you know, how many clicks through YouTube will, you know, we play the, you know, it used to be six degrees of Kevin Bacon, then there's the, we were doing how many clicks do you get to Alex Jones content or something on, on YouTube. Um, but we wanted to see um, whether 
there was anything we could ask of YouTube related to science news, or uh, sorry, of Google, that you couldn't actually find websites on. Now, it's kind of, you would imagine that's almost impossible already. So anyone think of something that uh, won't exist? Think about that in your head for a second. This is, what, this is what we came up with. Do vaccinations cause shaken baby syndrome? <laughs> There's just no way someone has made a claim that vaccinations are linked to the shaken baby syndrome. But there were articles <laughs> after articles after articles. And that's the problem. Even if YouTube fixes things, even if, 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 if Google begins to, to do more human curation of their results, the problem is search engines, are they gobble everything up that's there, and there's no way that the medical field has time or the resources to catch up with all of these conspiracies. So we're, our, we're just entangled in the technology, and I think it's just a reality, but we just need to, to sort of recognize it. Also, in a, you know, along with that idea is that the medium we use, uh, the, the medium we use influences what we say and how that message spreads. For example, this paper recently just came out in Nature News about extreme opponents of genetically these GMOs. Um, they know the least, but they think they know the most. Sounds like Americans in some ways in general overall. They're <laughs> very confident in what they know. Um, but, but the point here isn't necessarily to show you about this study, but to say, I put human behavior up here, and that sort of conveys. It's a medium by which it, you know, it conveys signals. But what happens when something like this goes up? Astrophysics and aerospace technology, it looks pretty legitimate. Looks like a journal, even says open access. It has, you can even probably get an ISSN number. But when you start reading the first paragraph, and please don't, you'll get disoriented really fast. I, I, I do. Um, that medium can be um, confusing to those that are not scientists, and even scientists themselves. And, and scientists have been fighting back against these predatory journals and predatory conferences, putting people like Borat on boards, um, on journal boards, and getting, uh, you know, getting published. Actually, one of my favorite journals of all, and we, we have collections, actually, we have projects in my lab where we, we try to curate lists of predatory journals and non-predatory journals. Um, and one of my favorite um, who was, which, uh, journal, which was created in response to one of these publishers saying, come start a journal with us. He started this journal. And it was called um, The Adaptation, Sexual Selection, Harmony of the Oceans, and Living Earth. They did put it out. Um, and it is a real journal. If you want to go and um, publish in it, you can. They've got a real board and everything. But this is the problem. Scientists kind of know about this, but the public doesn't. And I think, um, you know, we think we actually know it uh, as scientists that we could even spot these things. But I'm going to give you guys a couple here. Can you spot the articles? What I'm asking if they're questionable journals. And one of the reasons I have to put questionable now, because I, you know, as you can imagine, some of these journals are you're suing academics, making fun of them as predatory. So I'm putting questionable. I know this is being videoed. Questionable journals. Um, so um, here's one. Read the article. Here's the article. I'll, I'll let you read it for a sec. Is this a questionable journal, or is it a real journal? And what I mean by real journal, it's at least indexed in a major uh, a major uh, scholarly bibliographic database like Clarivate's ISI Web, uh, um, Web of Science or Scopus. Okay, raise your hand if you think this is a legitimate journal by that standard, that it's been indexed by the Web of Science. A few of you, okay. Turns out this one is legitimate. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that, like, the article could be terrible, it does, but, but this, but you can't just look at the title, that's the point. Even us in science and those that study science communication. Here's another one. Expected results so that no uh, longer nose means slower times for passing the salt and pepper, a second report. <laughs> now, I wish I was a part of this particular one, I think. Um, but, okay, uh, raise your hand if you think it's uh, questionable or if it's legitimate. So questionable if you think it, raise your hand if you think it's questionable. Now you guys are being, okay, you guys are good on that one. Okay, you win on that one. I have lots more, many more. But the point is that this medium, if it's hard for us, and we have tons more, and, and some of them are hard and some of them are a little bit easier, but can imagine how hard it is for journalists. Imagine how hard it is for someone from the public that doesn't have that training. And so there are all, all sorts of issues. And I could go on and on like many, and, I, and I, just the talks today have been fantastic and the discussions. Um, scientists are human. These are sort of the key things that sort of ring in my head. I just wanted to highlight a few in the first part of the talk. Scholarly communication is going through growing pains with open access, and, and, and I'm a huge advocate of open access. 
but, but with the sort of onslaught of predatory journals, it is making it harder for journalists to do their job. There's translational issues between science and press. Conspiracy brewing is money making, and specifically in science and health, and so we have to contend against that, and we're always going to contend going forward unless, you know, a major world catastrophe happens. We're always going to have technology entanglements. But I want to do for the rest of the talk is focus on what our, my, my colleague Carl Bergstrom and I, is our main mission in our effort in this, what we call the Calling BS Project. Um, and it's a response to the sort of the data revolution or the data movement. Science has been doing this for a long time, and it's proud of its ability to count, to measure, to analyze, and to assess. And we sort of talk with data through these kinds of mediums, through figures and tables and numbers. And they're convincing. Like, look at, looking at this, Statista is not left or right leaning. It sells data sets. If you looked at this, this actually went across our desk. A lot of these go across our desk. Some people will send them through Twitter, through our Twitter account, or we get them in other various ways. We saw this. So carbon dioxide emissions from global fossil fuels and industrial processes from 1751 to 2016. I'll tell you this, the data is right. So if you looked at this, you might think, what do we have to worry about then? If you're in the front, you have an advantage because you're seeing something strange here. <laughs> Turns out, I've already seen some in the front seeing it, you have 30-year increments, 1751, 1781, 1811. They go in 30-year increments. And then at 2010, they all of a sudden go in 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. And they weren't purposely trying to make this mistake. In fact, I think my colleague had, had uh, uh, tweeted them and they had sort of taken it down pretty quickly. But what we tell our students and we want to make them as uh, sort of adept at doing this as possible, is to quickly strip down the data in these digital forms, just regraph it, and use that standard, probably, I don't know, 200-year-old standard of uh, you know, even tick marks on the x-axis. <laughs> um, and this is what you find. Quite different story. But this sort of sits, it sort of, and a lot of times, data and graph graphs, can you can get sort of a visceral response. You can sort of, feels good. Um, if it sort of aligns with what you already think, so it, you know, it, it sort of, it, it, um, you know, we could talk about you know, confirmation bias specifically uh, with data as a means. And numbers sort of do carry this veneer of authority. They're, they do suggest careful experiment and precision and the scientific approach. And that's why 37% you know, of public lectures include made up <laughs> statistics. So um, watch out for those, especially post-dinner, um, those post-dinner ones. But we've known for a long time that words have this fuzzy concept to them. They're products of human minds. They're subjective. We've been trained on this since we were born. Um, they have this sort of idiosyncraticness of whoever's speaking. They're contingent. But, but numbers seem to just drop directly from nature. They're objective. And the key thing is they're scientific. They're replicable. They're inevitable. And just to give you an example of this in sort of the real world, if I took the same story, and this is the same story written um, from the Hill, you think the countries are giving us their best people. No, they give us their worst people. And you can kind of sort of get a sense of what it's implying, but it's not until numbers are thrown in on the same exact story that you get 2,139 DACA recipients convicted or accused of crimes against Americans. The 2,139, it feels big, it feels scary. But what should we always do with numbers? And when we talk to students, what, what, are they, all, what are we always trying to train them to do? Well, numbers need to be presented in context in the same ways that ideas and arguments need to be put into context. And if you do that, at least with this one, it turns out that 0.3% of the DACA recipients, yes, it is 2,139. Breitbart wasn't lying on that part, but they sure were presenting it in a way that sounded much more scary, given that 8.6% of Americans are convicted with some sort of felony. So the, the thing that sort of started this project was something Carl and I went back and forth on for years, is we just didn't think that we're teaching students to question numbers like we have them question other forms of communication. Um, and this is sort of now um, moved into, we were, we're working with uh, librarians and journalists and educators um, in high school. And a lot of this comes from work. So I, uh, with my colleagues, we co-founded and co-directed what's called the Data Lab 
We have around 15 PhD students and postdocs. And what I've learned in this time in running the lab is that students right now are really, really good at the mechanics of data science. They're really good. If I have them find the Jacobian of a transformation, they can do it better than I can. They can replicate algorithms um, that we see in the literature faster than I can. But what I'm finding is that they don't sort of question data in the same ways that they question other aspects of their life. And that was sort of the, the start of the, this Calling BS course. And we actually have a Calling Bull without the SHIT for the high schools that we work with. We have a callingbull.org, so you can get the non-swear word version as well. Um, and we, we, we have, we're always changing the content. We have around 50 hours of lecture. Um, and you know, we had a little bit of a hard time getting it through the university, but it's, it usually fills within a minute, 160 seats. And, and uh, what I want, to know, want you to note, though, is that we do care a lot about science communication down here. We spend a significant amount of time, and we have to be careful because we don't want to make students feel that science is completely broken, but we really care about it. We have all sorts of offshoots projects that are coming. The one that was mentioned in the introduction was one we released a couple weeks, uh, several weeks ago, something we call whichfaceisreal.com. Um, and the idea here was uh, it was to bring public attention to these GANs, which are generative adversarial networks, these algorithms that can produce these almost indistinguishably um, real-looking human faces. And we provide some ways to distinguish the sort of real ones from the fake ones, but the real point is just to make the world know that you not only can you Photoshop now, everyone knows that, so if they see an image, like, oh, it's probably been Photoshopped, but when you saw a human photo, there was something else real about that. There was something that, uh, that you just felt that um, there, there was more sort of truth uh, associated with whatever you found on the internet if it was a human face. But that's gone now. And, and by the way, does anyone know which one's real here? Raise your hand if you think the one on the right's real. Raise your hand if you think the one on the left is real. Whoa, that's like 50%, I bet. I bet I get, that's, that's basically the real results. Turns out, in just that short amount of time, over several weeks, we've had over 8 million games played on this from around the world. And the point here was to communicate these new areas of technology, because I'm in an information school, and I want them to know about these deep fakes. I want them to know. I don't care if they know how they work. I don't know, care if they actually know literally how to distinguish them. But I want them to know that not only can you counterfeit money on the internet, you can counterfeit people now. And that's something that, um, that Carl and I talk a lot about. And it has taken off, and that's exciting. But the most exciting part is that we have over 70 universities that have contacted us to, to, to teach this content. We've had conversations with, with many of them. Or they've all contacted us. We just, some of them, we've really worked with them closely. So there's a little bit of a BS movement, I think, in, in education going on. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you won't be able to find it because we have tens of thousands of them. You won't be able to dig that. I just <laughs> screenshot. So it turns out I wrote it in my notes because I, I struggle. I miss these a lot too. Turns out that's the one that was real. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that crazy? So you can go play the game, actually. And I will tell you this. We're going to play. Um, we are going, we're going to release some new games just to because people were starting to get good at identifying. They, they basically, people, I can give you the tricks real quick. One, you look at background. That gives you a little clue. And that, that's one of the better clues. You can look at asymmetries. So, the, so re, for every reason, the machine has a hard time building, you know, putting earrings that are completely symmetrical or, or, or the bevels on glasses. Um, and it has all these things that doesn't do well. But, you know, give it a couple of years and it will do that fine. So that's why, you know, you can learn these things right now. But the new game is going to be a little bit like Tinder where we'll just have one image and you have to swipe left or right. If it's real, we're going to remove the backgrounds, do these kind of things. One, to keep it fun, but also to see if we can maybe keep ahead of the technology for a little while. And we have some other games coming out, too. You'll, you'll get to see here soon. Um, but the cool thing, actually, we have IRB support to look at all the usage data uh, um, for, um, for all these games that have been played. It's all anonymized. We don't know who it is. Um, but we can start to see uh, the sort of the, um, you know, what, what the machine is doing well in its, with its training data that's giving, what, what is it, you know, where is its weaknesses. So it's, it, it's an interesting side project. Um, but these are one of several things we're working on. But the point here is we have this network now. So when we develop things or other schools will develop things and send stuff to us, we can sort of push them out to our network. And one thing we, we used to, we kind of joke about a little bit is, you know, it, you know, it did sort of spread across the, kind of, the, the world. Um, and we've had contacts, but we still haven't had North Korea. We actually do have Greenland now. That's an old one. No Sub-Saharan Africa. These aren't requests for, this, uh, for um, the, the course. This is just sort of um, you know, going into the website. But this is also misleading. So I talk a lot. I mean, the core of the course is talking about misleading graphics. And you can see that if you have one person from Russia, 
come to your website, it goes, you know, and it lights up the whole screen. So it's totally misleading, um, but it's just fun. We, we, we still would like to have North Korea come and visit our site. No, no one from that. But we're also moving a lot. We're spending a lot of time in high schools. Last year, or last week, we ran our first what we called Miss Info Day. And we brought high school students from around Washington um, and uh, from rural areas and urban areas and spent a day talking about misinformation. And my love is around science. And we're trying to figure out, we're actually talking to other universities maybe to have a day, March 19th or whatever, where we would spend time, a day just thinking about their digital environments, about uh, science communication, about um, you know, misinformation, disinformation in general. It was really fun. Uh, we, we looked to, to sort of expand more into the high school area. And that was supported by the Knight Foundation. But the central philosophy behind the class is this that so much of technology and statistics and anything sort of run by data analysis, there is this black box. And it's the intimidating black box. And it's the way that you can BS with numbers. Because you can say, oh, I ran a multinomial regression. And people's eyes sort of glaze over. And they say, oh, they must be right because they ran a multinomial regression or whatever it is. Or they ran a random forest algorithm. And, and these things just sound jargony and scary. And they must be right. And that's the problem. that. Um, this black box is the part um, that intimidates, but it's also the part where you actually make the least amount of mistakes, where people mostly make mistakes. And I, all of us, have, a lot of us have reviewed, I've reviewed hundreds of articles over, over my career and uh, time doing this. Most of the time, I find that the problem is in the data input or in the data output or, inter or the interpretation of that output. And it's there, I think, that we can teach anyone. No, they don't, people don't have to have a PhD in statistics or, or machine learning or computer science to be able to call BS on about, you know, on a, a, a large proportion of, of the problems out there that deal with data. So let me give you an example. Because when I say this, a lot of people will say, OK, that sounds good. But can you really just pick up a science paper or any kind of paper, not science the journal, but a sort of technical paper and be able to call BS? Here's an example. This is one I've used several times because I think it's a nice example of, of you know, it has consequences for society. But when this came out several years ago, it was published on the archive, and I had some colleagues and I, we immediately sort of looked at it and started reading it, and we're just sort of almost uh, offended by what they were already claiming. But we had to at least read the paper. And, and the claim here was that you could look at a, an image, a face, and you could tell whether someone was a criminal or not. This was, it sounds ridiculous, right? But it was, pub it was put out in, in all sincerity. Uh, from a, a respectable, a very good university. Um, <laughs> and this sort of goes back to Cesare Lombroso. Um, you know, he was sort of the father of criminology. And he, he sort of ended his career with this idea that you could look at the morphogenic features of a person's face, and you could tell where they were criminal. And fortunately, after about 30 years, it was debunked as pseudoscience. But now it's sort of rearing its head in computer science all over. And here, um, what they had claimed, and you'll notice this, I'll do nothing with the black box. I won't tell you, by the way, they probably, comp they, I, I'm, I'm almost sure that that was, you know, that was run perfectly fine. But the training data is really the input here that you need to look at. The training data, they were from, um, they were from these uh, convicted criminals, and convicted was a key point here too. Um, they're, they're pictures uh, of these convicted criminals and professional um, pictures that were on kind of like, they don't have LinkedIn in Seattle or in China. Um, but they had, they, they're sort of not, they're, they're non-criminals were from these kind of professional sites. And here's the, the, the sort of uh, statement that's read in the paper. And you see this time and time again. I even just saw one just a couple weeks ago that had a very similar sentiment. And this is how it reads. Unlike a human examiner judge, a computer vision algorithm or classifier has absolutely no subjective baggages, no emotions, no biases whatsoever due to past experience, race, religion, political doctrine, gender, age, et cetera, no mental fatigue, no preconditioning, et cetera. And when we do these kinds of things, one of the, what this is in our class, we allow for students to do this at any time. And they yell out, yes, you know, they, this is, this is a, of course, BS, because not only is it just as bad as humans, it's, it's, it's many times worse. And so you go to the results part of the section, and there's a claim here that um, there's this angle, theta, between the nose and the, the corners of your mouth and this sort of curvature part, rho, that were the, was the distinguishing feature between these two groups, one group being the criminals and one group being the non-criminals. What did they find? What did they actually do? Not smiling. There you go, good, all right. So what they had developed is a smile detector, not a <laughs> criminal detector. And actually, if it was developed, you know, maybe in 2004, before Facebook 
you know, really got big, they might have been purchased by Facebook and made a lot of money. But in 2016, when this was published, it's not all that um, impressive. They had de basically developed a smile detector. And again, we've never moved into the black box yet. You can look at the training data again. You start to see this. That's when you look at their training data a little closer. You can look at their subtypes. They create these subtypes of the non-criminals and criminals. These are composite images of all the images. And you start to see this, again, without going anywhere near the black box. And that's the goal, and, and sort of this is sort of general goal, not just with this is just one example, but this is sort of how we approach any kind of data or algorithmic problem in this particular class. Now, there's times when we get into the black box. I have students that work on computer vision and some people that work in network science, and we have to, we do want people to know the black, black box if it's there, but, but many times if you focus on these other parts, that's the key. So, you know, we have, you know, like I said, over 50 hours of lectures, and so I can't go through all of that. So what I wanted to do tonight to end the talk here was to highlight a few of the real key things that we, that when we talk to the public, that we really want them to know. So I've already talked about sort of just this unwarranted authority of numbers. So just, you know, just make people aware of that. Don't be intimidated by the black box. And then, you know, of, you know, there's lists and lists of things, but these are the last things I'm just going to quickly go through and sort of illustrate how we talk to students about these things. Correlation versus causation, students always think they know what it means. I'll start talking about it and they'll go, oh yes, correlation doesn't imply causation. Okay, can I go get lunch? No, this is, I've heard it a million times. And then we test them and they really fail on this part. I mean, there's some things they do quite well. Now, I'm always surprised at how, you know, students are always smarter than, than you think they are, but they, this one's the one they struggle with, and I think the public struggles, I struggle with it. Um, so we really sort of hit that one hard, and selection bias, I bold, there's, this is bold, because if I could only teach one thing to the public about reasoning with data and sort of dissecting sans the black box, it would be teaching them about selection bias and hitting that over the head over and over. And of course, if you talk about numbers and data, how do we communicate? We communicate through graphics. So we have hundreds and hundreds of examples we go through, and we have little concepts around data graphics. So let me just go through a couple of those things real quick. So first of all, uh, we, you know, we, really, we, we really want students to think clearly about correlation and causation because they see it every single day. I see it every day. We pull examples down literally every day. The problem is there's this, there's this misconception about really what correlation by itself really is. And so one of the things we do is sort of just talk more about associations. So two, measure, two measurements are associated, and we talk about when, when knowing about the state of one tells you something about the other. So let me give you an example. So I'm, I live in Seattle. In the winter, it's, pretty uh, it's, a, it's a pretty strong association that if it's cloudy in the winter, it's going to be around 40 degrees. It's just not always, but that sort of, you know, students know that, and we use these sort of examples. And if there's no clouds to sort of keep the heat in, it's typically, let's say, around 20 degrees. We sort of kind of know that. So in common language, we sometimes use the term correlation instead of association, but we, we sort of, you know, they get, they get sort of intermingled a lot. But there is a distinction, because when scientists talk about correlation, they're usually talking about a linear correlation. So that would be like if I collected the heights of the, uh, we did the Minnesota Vikings, and I looked at the weight, there is this, there's this linear correlation between height and weight. But we know, again, correlation does not necessarily imply causation, but you see this every day. So here was a recent article, or actually a, stu a study that was done by Zillow Research that then spread massively around uh, the social media space. And the, 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 the claim here was that um, birth rates were going down where home values were going up. And so you're starting, the laughter, I think you can tell what's coming. So the idea here, if you look at the data, th this is the actual data that we've plotted um, in our own graph here, because that's one of the things we always tell the students, get a hold of the data for yourself. Don't just look at the data. So, and, we're try and that's why the, our, the field that I sort of work in is working a lot, and colleagues are working a lot in developing the tools to quickly take something out of a, a PDF or, 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 a, or a website and have that data to play with yourself. But, so if you look at changing house, housing prices as they get higher and higher, as you get more and more change in the house price, you get a, 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 um, a change in fertility rate. And so the question that, of course, people ask when they see this is, are people forced to choose between having a child and buying a house? And what's great, though, about this particular Zillow study is they did exactly what you would want them to do. So they, they noted in the first part of their sentence, you just basically need to, need to read the first part, as a further caveat, 
The, cor the correlation observed here is by no means proof that home value growth causes fertility declines. They did exactly what you'd want us you'd want them to do. So they haven't made any mistakes yet. But as you can imagine, like many of the examples I've seen today um, in the other sessions, this took off into many different places, very reliable places. Adverse effect of home, high home prices, fewer, fewer babies. And look at effect. How can you be more, you know, you make a, a more clear uh, problem? If you look down here to be causing, so down here on the bottom, Forget about a baby boom, rising home prices appear to be causing many would-be, uh, looks like, prevents uh, would-be parents to think twice about having a baby. One of the exercises we do, it sounds so silly and simplistic, but we have our students draw out these diagrams. We, we call them sort of causation diagrams. It's not something new people have been doing, but we really force it. We have pen, old-fashioned pen and paper a lot of times. They have to write these when we do the, the assessments and tests where we force them to have to write what, where the causation arrows might go. So in, you know, if we were to use smoking as an example, we know now in 2019 that smoking does cause cancer. And so you can write it in this arrow, and there's no confusion about that. But then what we'll do with examples like this is we'll write it the other way. Maybe it's cancer causes smoking. And that sounds ridiculous, right? But some of you probably know who made this famous argument. The father of statistics made this argument on the bottom. R.A. Fisher made this argument. Yes, exactly. He made, at the time, and, and it's not, it's, it's not uh, sort of knocking R.A. Fisher at all. He's an incredibly intelligent part. He is one of the fathers of modern statistics. And he here was, was making a claim that those that get cancer then, you know, would, would be more likely to smoke, and he made this claim. But we look at that sort of silly now, but the point is by drawing these diagrams, you can sort of look for common causes. You can find areas where there's multiple arrow, arrows that go in different directions. And when you see these well-designed, so here's a well-designed study that really spread. A well-designed, it was a well-designed uh, uh, observation study that did show correlation only, and it reports this correctly throughout the paper multiple times. But this led to just, you, I, probably hundreds, I don't collect all, we didn't collect all of them, but you can see it was in time, exercise can lower risk of some cancers by 20%, health buzz, exercise cuts cancer risk, huge study finds. These, these studies become prescriptive. And so that's the one of the things that we tell students to look out for. Look out for prescriptive headlines, because if they're written as prescriptions, they're implying causation. Um, I go, here's another one, exercise drives down risk for 13 cancers, research shows. And actually there was a recent study in, in PLOS One that actually went through many of these headlines and found that one third of journal articles misat misattribute causality based on correlative evidence and half of the news articles did so. But that, the interesting part was not the news articles, I mean you'd kind of, you know, it, journalists are, they're hardworking and they're, they got a lot on their hands. And, but it was a lot of the, 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 the scientists themselves that, might, that probably had more time to sort of look through this than the journalists. And we have fun sort of making fun of everyone, including ourselves. Students always call BS on us, too, a lot of times. But I had to put this one out. I know Laura, Laura's here from Washington Post. But um, Washington Post uh, finds NPR listeners are among the least likely to fall for politicians' false claims. Inoculate yourself against BS. Listen to NPR. <laughs> Now, after I've shown like these other examples, you guys are getting primed, which is good. So what we like to do is have a little bit of fun um, on Twitter. Mainly, this is a fun thing, because we all make these mistakes. So we responded to this, saying, inoculate yourself against BS. Don't accept prescriptive claims based on correlative data. So that's what you got to watch out for, um, are those kinds of examples. But partly, it's, it's the education system itself's fault. So there are these subtle suggestions of causality just in the way that we display data. So here's the same exact data set the Zillow data set, where um, you have, again, change in home value and change in fertility rate. And that x-axis seems to really imply it is that sort of that independent variable and the dependent variable on the y-axis. There seems to be this relationship. Why do people believe that? Why do we sort of, I mean, we make that jump partly because we've been trained that way in our education system. So when you, you learn about functions for the first time, Literally here, the x value, you put in an x value and you get a y value. This is the sine curve. 
If you, you know, in, you know, when you took a chemistry lab, maybe in high school, you might have done some titrations, and you add a, a, a titrant, and the pH, the, the pH level changes. You have an independent variable, you have a dependent variable. There is that relationship. In biology, we, uh, in the life sciences, in ecology, same thing. This is, um, uh, this is uh, you know, a famous uh, plot that showed that as you increase the, the square area, you're going to have more species, kind of obvious, right? But, but what's clear here is that it's not, it certainly wouldn't be species causing more square area. Um, <laughs> And it sounds silly, but that's, so having it in that way matters. So if we go back to that example of the changing housing prices, you have your changing house price and the changing fertility. We know that it's an association. So it goes back to that issue of an association. So Carl and I have been bouncing around all these different ideas about, well, how, is there a way that we can get away from this, this idea that the x-axis implies you know, the dependent variable or the predictor and the y axis is the response variable or the, the dependent variable. Is there anything we can do? I mean, one thing we thought, it sounds so silly even in retrospect, we thought, why don't we just sort of rotate the plot as a way to just jar the reader, like, whoa, what's going on? And in that, in that time, then you, you're at least communicating to the reader, I promise you, this is only an association. It's not. There isn't a causal um, uh, relationship between these, or at least anything that we know of. And so we, we sort of were having fun writing some of these cute little papers and different design ideas on how we could communicate better in journalism and in science, little things. And this, there's, this might not be the right idea. There's probably plenty. We actually have, and others have given us lots of ideas too. But we need to do a better job in communicating with the graphics that we use about things like correlation causation, since it's so common. Now, I mentioned to you this, this issue of selection bias. Um, it's, uh, like I said, it's probably, it's one of my, um, probably the one I, I, I push as hard as all of them because it's, it's, it's a simple enough concept, but it's so powerful if you get that into a student, especially in high schools earlier, and they come to college with it, knowing sort of this. And, and, I, and there's great examples that convey selection bias. This was one of my favorite that Darren, um, Darren Daly put out sort of here. Survival bias means that this app will get fantastic reviews, identifying any mushroom instantly with just a pick. That's an example of selection bias, of course, because those that survive are the only ones that can do a review of the mushroom um, app. And actually, my kids, you know, they're starting to hear commercials. And so they start, you know, you listen on the radio or you hear, you know, you see them on TV or whatever. You hear, you see this. Switching savings, if this is progressives advertising, switching saves you over $500 on average. New farmers, customers who purchase multiple policies, save on average about $500. Geico, big savings. New Geico cousin reported an average savings over $500. Like, what is it about $500? And if you go to Allstate, drivers who switch saved, actually, they don't save as much at Allstate, I'm just realizing. It's about $498. You should go to the other ones. No, actually, maybe Allstate's actually being more honest. So why is that? How can every insurance company be about $500 cheaper than its competitors? Well, we got a selection bias problem. If you're actually switching, let's just assume that we can believe these these advertisements, if you're, if you're actually doing the switch, it's because you actually save money. I don't know how much it is, but that's the point. Selection bias occurs when the people you sample differ systematically from the population. And, you know, it sounds so obvious, and I'm sort of, you know, this is a public talk, but I even talk to my students and sort of always trying to remind myself. And ignoring this can produce really misleading estimates about a population, of course. So let me give you one more example about this. This, this is one I, uh, it's, it's hopefully um, all telling. Imagine you wanted to get the state of marriage. Um, uh, just get a sense of, let's say, how husbands are reflected in American culture. So you could use some of these social platforms like Facebook. You could use their autocompletes. And you could search for things like you could search. You just put up, my husband is on Facebook. And you say, my best friend, my life, awesome, my everything, the best quotes, my love, my best friend means. And if you only use this platform, it's a gigantic platform. You think that would be sufficient enough, right? Well, if you do that exact same autocomplete search on Google, this is what you get. <laughs> no kidding, and you can do it. I had to check it again to make sure it was real. I had to, again, because I had to update. They're always updating their algorithm. But I was today, and this has you know, been around for a little while. So these are the kinds of things we have to watch out for, even if you think the population you have is gigantic. Um, you have to be careful, and you always want people questioning that. So let me end here, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, one of the most important things that we can teach students, um, if nothing else, I talk about the, my love affair with selection bias, 
But it's really um, visualizations that I think if that's the only time that we get with students, and like for example, Miss Info Day, or when we, when we have our courses, we really make sure that we spend time on data graphics, because they're a way that you can immediately get, get students much more adept at, at, at seeing mistakes. And I'll just say a lot of times it's mistakes, because one of the things I want to mention that I mentioned to the students is, and we actually spend time at the beginning of the course, is talking again about civics and dialogue. We really enforce that. We try to be completely nonpartisan. For every example on the left, I try to always have an example on the right that's mistakes. And a lot of times, you know, at first students get this, they get this power feeling like, yeah, I'm starting to call BS. They're finding um, things in the news. And they almost get a little bit too aggressive about it. And, and one of the things that we talk about is uh, don't assume malice when you see something right away. Um, you know, instead, maybe assume, some, assume stupidity before that. And even better than stupidity, just assume honest mistake. And I think a lot of the time, most of the time, it is honest mistake. Um, but in doing that, then they become, I, I, think, I mean, that's part of, I think, our job as educators to make sure that we do bring back civics again. So let me just quickly, you know, make a few points about visualizations. They've been around a long time, but actually, um, it's only in the last 20 years that we've really become much more sophisticated because we have the software tools, we have the ability now to create these much more sophisticated graphs and forms of uh, data telling and data storytelling. Most of the graphs, you know, in the 1920s, this is a clip from the New York Times in the 1920s, you would see these pie graphs and sort of these geographic maps. And we, you know, we have become much more sophisticated um, in our graphs. There was one, one of my favorite ones over the last um, several months during the whole Mueller investigation came out of MSNBC, how uh, sophisticated it was. Um, it well, had a bar graph here of um, three and up two. I mean, pretty silly. But in all seriousness, the, you know, if you have a, you know, a newsroom like the New York Times, which has about 30 or so uh, visualization experts that only do visualization, most journalism rooms obviously don't have that kind of luxury. And they create these beautiful interactive plots and I love them, I play with them all the time, I'm a huge fan, but even with these really beautiful interactive plots, we can run into problems. Because in statistics, we have this multiple comparison problem. Many of you know that if you, if, if you know anything about statistics, it's a really, uh, 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 it's a problem we have to look out for. The idea is if you look enough times, you're eventually gonna get statistical significance and wahoo, then you can get it published. Um, the problem is you can do that with interactive visualizations. If you give it just to the reader without being careful on how you develop those, you can get the same kinds of problems because you can sort of break the data in many different ways and finally get your answer. But more simple things, it, that's a more sophisticated way of looking at uh, or being careful with data graphics. One of the ones that, that's something that Carl and I call the principle of proportional ink is violated all the time. It's this idea that the ink pixels devoted, it's building off of you know, Tufti's ideas and many others, the idea is that the pixels you devote to your number on a screen need to be proportional. So here is an example where it's violating the principle of proportional ink. Here was a story that came out of Germany, um, uh, economics department I think it was, showing how Germans at 40.4 were much more industrious than those lazy French at 37.4. But of course the problem here is they're zooming in and they've cut off um, the uh, the x-axis here to make the difference look much bigger. So how do you fix that violation of principal proportional ink? If you take that data and you replot it, it tells a much different story. It's a very simple idea, but you, would, you won't believe how many places it's violated. Because Carl and I are very particular about this, so we actually get our measure, we get a ruler out, we actually have software kind of rulers now, and we can measure when this is violated. And sometimes it's not just because they're violating the zooming effect, they're zooming x and axis, x axis or y axis, they're actually changing the size of it and reporting a different number. So in this, this what came out of the Hillary campaign, people had noticed this particular one, but they write 84%, but guess how long the bar is? 90%. And actually with three dimensional figures, you see really big effects because the three dimensions actually changes the, um, the, the sort of, uh, you know, your, the, the, pers the perspective altogether. And so actually if you add the volume, it's sometimes, you know, thousands of times um, difference. We have to be careful of that. Now, there's there's examples uh, all the time where stories are being told about, um, let's say, new laws here. This was the 2000, 
five um, stand your ground law, very controversial law. And the, the point of the story was to see what has happened after this stand your ground law. This is, you know, if someone's going to attack you, you can use your gun, and it drops um, after 2005. But the problem is the y axis has been flipped, and zero is at the top, again, breaking a very long standing tradition. And the author here is an example where it was an honest mistake. The, art, the, the person that created this graphic you know, got a lot of flack, and she admitted that she tried to create a graphic that had blood flowing down. <laughs> and in doing that, sometimes we put aesthetics above sort of the story. Now, there's other things you can do. So uh, the Wall Street Journal wrote this article about you know, who we should be taxing, or you know, an article about which of the, the tax brackets we should be taxing to generate the most amount of revenue. But like that first example I showed you from Statista, there's something strange going on with the bins. This is a histogram, so it's the number in each one of these, and you, you, you have them summed up. You have these bins of 5K, then it goes, you know, jumps to 10K, and then all of a sudden we're at 100K, 300K. And as I always tell my students, histograms, because we see these kinds of stories all the time with histograms, if you allow me to change the bins of a histogram, you can tell all three stories. You can, you can write a new story about taxing the poor, taxing the middle class, and taxing the wealthy just by changing the bins. Here you should tax the wealthy. There you should tax the middle class, and there you should tax the, the poor. And this was a, a really nice thing by Ken Schultz. And if there's only one climate change graph you'd ever need to see, this is one I, I show commonly because it's, it's one that it's been, it, mainly because it's been, it's been spread so far, even today in 2019, um, it's spread all the time. But the point here was that this is actual data. The data has not been cha changed, but of course, it's zoomed out so far that it looks like a flat line. And the good thing here is that Philip Bump at Washington Post said, Post said well, give me the data. That it, was, it was data from NASA. We replotted it, and you start to see that two degree. And then we can have a discussion about the two degree difference, and it tells a much different story. But one of my favorite sort of um, responses are ones where they sort of um, do uh, sort of like a reductio ad absurdum, where um, someone at Bloomberg said, well, if you buy this graph and this method of telling the story, then I'll put time on the x-axis and time on the y-axis, zoom out far enough, and prove to you that time doesn't, doesn't go forward. <laughs> so this, 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 this was great. So I've spent you know, most of today talking about, I, you know, I talked to you about all, you know, we can, you know, and everyone else, I'm in a room of experts of science communication, which is a real pleasure for me. This has been a, a real uh, neat event to talk to everyone here. But the main thing I want you to take, you know, at least what, what, that I put a lot of my effort, and I would love to talk to others about how we can teach the public, teach librarians, journalists, educators, even ourselves, you know, ourselves, become better reasoners of data since it is everywhere. And I'll just end like I end all my lectures when I talk about science to students, that despite the problems I talked about today with science, it still works. At, the hu at, at a human scale, we can start to figure out sort of the beginnings of the universe at one side, so scale all the way to sort of the, the molecular beginnings of life at another scale. It's a beautiful thing, and despite some of the, fa the, the fact that the humans are involved, it works, and I still have a love affair for science. So thanks for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.